to be obedient. And Lord, please give me your words and yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today we're going to be continuing in Romans, and we will be in Romans chapter 2. Uh, would you all stand with me as we honor God's word? Romans chapter 2. There are Bibles under the seats if you need one. Romans chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And we'll wait for everyone to get it. I see some people turning. Hallelujah. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man. Every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenetrant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Amen. Today, I would like to speak to you all from the title, The Incompatibility of Judgment and the Gospel. The Incompatibility of Our Judging One Another and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, that title took a couple of guys aback when I told them this morning because they said, well, wait a minute, judgment is godly and right. And I would also say that judgment is part of the gospel, and it is most certainly righteous. The first type of judgment is God's judgment. And this is where the gospel begins, doesn't it? Because all of us have sinned. All of us missed the mark. No one is perfect. And what we learned a couple of weeks ago in chapter 1 is that in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. It is revealed in the sense that our God is so holy that sin has to be paid for. It's the judgment of God. The gospel is, Romans 1.16, that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation being saved from our sins for those who believe. So that's God's judgment, and it is part of the gospel. There's another type of judgment that is also righteous, and that is the idea of judging ourselves, right? The scripture teaches us to judge yourself lest you be judged. We judge ourselves because we have been commanded to seek God's 
holiness. We have been commanded to seek obedience. And so what we as believers do, even though God has covered us with Jesus' righteousness, we still judge ourselves and say, hey, am I pleasing the Lord? That's self-judgment, and it is righteous and good. But our text today deals with the unrighteousness and downright hypocrisy of judging others. Let's read verses 1 and verses 3 to kind of get started here. You have no excuse, O oh man. Every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. You already have seen two big, blaring, horning words here. We, say, we see that it said we have no excuse if we judge, and we have seen that we are condemned if we judge. Why? Because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Let's pause there for a second. This is always truth. Why is it always true? Why is that statement always true that we who judge are practicing the same things? Because to judge someone else is to be lifted up in pride and say that you know well enough and that you are good enough to cast judgment. The scripture is very clear. It is Jesus that will judge us. Why can Jesus judge us? Because he is perfect. I cannot judge anyone because in my judging, I am also being unrighteous. Let's look at verse 3. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who Judge those who practice such things. If you want to know what the such things are, um, listen to last week's message or read Romans chapter 1, verses uh, 29 to the end of the chapter, and you'll see a big list of things that are unrighteous acts. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God. This doctrine of the hypocrisy and self-condemning nature of judging others' sin is held together by the fact that no one is perfect except for God. Jesus also taught and warned against judging another believer. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7 to see what Jesus has to say about this subject. Matthew chapter 7. Starting at verse 1. Judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. That is a terrifying statement. If you're anything like me, when it comes to the sin of judging others, you can be pretty harsh. 
And so Jesus is saying the same level by which you are judging others and not giving others the benefit of doubt and not showing mercy and not saying, yes, you are wrong, but you are under Jesus' forgiveness if you are a believer. The same level of callousness and judgment that we portray to others, Jesus says, we will receive. It makes us want to be a little bit more merciful, doesn't it? You see, it's it's not that we can't observe sin in others or wrong in others, but it is the condemnation and judgment and moral superiority that the text is getting at. I think there's a saying that says something like, there is one God and you are not him. I don't know how it goes. Is that how it goes? Let's continue on and and hear what Jesus is saying here. Verse 3. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? Again, Jesus is acknowledging that we have sinfulness and flaws. But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. In other words, as true as it is that we see sin in others, it is a thousand percent also true that we ourselves have sin. Do you see this in the text? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. In other words, work on yourself. Work on your own sin. Work on your own faults. Ask and say, God, where am I missing the mark? If we do that, then perhaps God will use us to help and serve and pull others out of the fire. The scripture talks about this. But it can't be done if we don't have our own heart of self-examination and our own heart of sanctification and our own heart of humility towards God. Personal awareness. There is some many things in my life that I am ashamed of, but I have an early memory of something that I am extremely ashamed of, and it highlights this point of hypocrisy. I remember being in fifth grade and having a science teacher. And looking back as an adult, this woman had like some kind of a hyper condition, like with sweat under her arms. Again, something that she can't do nothing about. And I remember joining in with other kids in the class, because this was like every day that we saw like these kind of big stains under her arms. And we would make fun of her. And I was so bold, I, I, I never forget. I remember raising my hands and saying, asking a question related to the rainforest, trying to be slick, sneak dissing the fact that she had a condition. I, that was cruel. And looking back, she must have just felt bad because, again, this is something she can't do anything about. What does this have to do with the text? Because I never forgot this memory, <laughs> as I was going through puberty, I remember having, it had to be for at least a couple of years, that that was me. I was walking around, you could, I couldn't raise my arms without seeing a huge puddle of sweat. And I never forgot, like, it, I made the connection, wow, I was talking, and this is me as my 12, 13-year-old, over-spiritualized mind saying, this is the judgment of God on me. I made in front of her, and now for the rest of my life, I'm going to have these huge puddles under my arms. I really believed that. 
because I was judging someone and I had the same thing happening to me. Judging someone else's public sin and offering justifications and that was different when it comes to my own private sins is hypocrisy. I see someone doing something public. I see someone get arrested for DWI and judge them, condemn them. And then I'm sitting at home and I'm drunk. Nobody knows about this. And I'll say, well, that is different because I was at home. No, the Bible is clear. Don't be drunk with wine, but what? Be filled with the Spirit. Or maybe I make justifications for myself and say, well, my sin isn't as bad as someone else's. James 2 and 10 has a response for those times when we have that sort of an attitude. Let's turn there. James chapter 2. Those white lies that I tell. That time I get caught. Well, mine was different. I kind of had to do that because of this, or I was forced to do that, or, you know, it was, it was, there were circumstances around what I did. James chapter 2, starting at verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Let's pause there. In other words, maybe I haven't cheated on my wife, but I lied about something on my job. It's the same thing. If I've broken one, then I've broken them all. So again, that's why it makes no sense for me to judge someone else. Verse 12, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For the judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Again, repeating what Jesus has said. For mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, what does it mean when it says, act and speak as those who are judged under the law of liberty? This is pointing to the fact that as a believer, again, we have Christ's imputed righteousness. In other words, we are free to serve God knowing that sometimes we're going to sin, but we won't be judged by our own sin. Instead, we are going to be judged by Jesus' righteousness. How beautiful was the gospel? And so then it goes on to say, this is how we should judge one another. So if, if Mike is a believer and he has messed up, I am supposed to look at him the way that Jesus looks at him, which is he has my righteousness. Which is described as, as the scripture saying that God's mercy triumphs over his judgment. We have been talking the last two weeks about the wrath of God, but the truth of the matter is God would rather have mercy. And what do we have to do in order to get this mercy? He says, just believe. 
That is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. This is a universal truth. As certain as we are that we are not perfect before the Lord is also the certainty of the truth that we ought not judge our brothers or sisters in their walk. Because to judge and condemn is at the very least to be lifted up in pride. Meaning we feel confident enough in our own holiness, in our own right thinking, right? Scripture talks about how every man's ways are right in his own eyes. We are so confident in our own right thinking that we feel entitled to judge others. Well, the scripture is saying to us today that if we do this, we are without excuse and that we are hypocrites and that we are unrighteousness. We are unrighteous. What does this judgment of others look like? I think one way we could look at it is with our eyes. Have you ever just looked at something or someone or a situation and you have just made judgment on that person already? You're looking at them in a downcast way. This judgment can also take place in the way we think about others. Have you ever been condemned and later you, the person found out that they, weren't, they didn't have all of the right facts? Maybe they were missing the relationship piece. It takes the form of gossiping. It takes the form of perhaps going past gossiping and slandering. So not only am I talking about this person, but I am pronouncing that this person is this. It takes the form of self-righteousness. I am self. I'm the righteous one. These other dudes, they don't, they need to tighten up. I think one of the other forms that it takes is comparing. Because when we compare, like if I were to try to compare my walk with Ben's walk, because I am the one comparing, I have this bias, and I'm saying, you know, Ben is, is messing around. He needs to be doing it like I'm doing it. That is judging others. This is why the scripture vehemently declares judges as hypocrites, because the very act of judging involves loads of unrighteousness, even if it isn't in the manner of sin that the judgment involves. In other words, if I'm judging Cindy for murdering someone, even if I'm not a murderer, I am displaying unrighteousness, and I too am not justified. Let's look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And we're going to start at verse 9. I think this should help us to have a posture of a heart that is guarded against the foolishness of judging others. This was alluded to by Kevin last week during his prayer. Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 9. This is Jesus. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, 
would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, what made this tax collector go away justified? Go away righteous. Because he acknowledged that, yes, it is true, I am a sinner. Yes, it is true, I am not perfect. Yes, God, more than anything, I know I am not worthy, but God, would you have mercy on me? This is the mindset that we should have. A mindset that understands that, yes, it is true that no one is righteous, no, not one, and all the righteousness I have, anything good that I'm doing is all by his grace. Also acknowledging that, God, I need your mercy. I have no righteousness of my own to stand on. If we can have that type of heart, then we won't find ourselves judging others. So, if we are not to judge, how are we to handle perceived sin in the body? I think there's a few ways. I think the first way is that we judge ourselves. Again, I'm trying to get at how are we, it's true that one day, maybe I'm caught in sin. What are we supposed to do about it? First thing is we judge ourselves. We have a lifestyle of examining ourselves and seeking God's holiness and killing sin in our lives. The second way that we execute righteous judgment is that we go to our brothers and our sisters in love. In other words, Joe comes to me and says, brother, I I know he already has his mindset that we just described of the tax collector knowing that he himself has his own issues. And he goes to me as in Ephesians 4, speaking the truth in love and says, brother, I know this is going on, what happened, how can we restore you, the scripture talks about, how can I warn you, but he's clothed with God's humility and with God's love when he comes to me. He is not armed with judgment and armed with condemnation. Yes, in fact, we ought to be able to go to one another in love and in humility. The third way is church discipline. This is one of the reasons why church membership is so important. How can I, how can one of the elders have the authority to come to you and say, hey, this is what I think needs to happen if you have not even joined the church? But the scripture outlines church discipline and it is even used, Paul talks about it in one way, of kicking someone out of the church so that they would be driven back. The last way is the scripture talks about restoration. Restoring such a brother who has been caught in a sin. So instead of going with a heart of judgment, even though sin is present, we go with a heart of how can we get you back in the fold? Above all, there is a prayer and there is entreating the only true righteous judge in prayer, which is God praying for one another. So family, let us not judge. 
Instead, let this be the epitaph of our life found in verse 7. Let's go back to our original scripture. Romans chapter 2. Epitaph is a fancy word that says, let this be said about you when you die. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory, honor, immortality, he will give eternal life. What is this scripture getting at? It says, to those who by patience in well-doing. Part of that has to do with the idea that not only is God patient with us, but we are patient with one another and patience with ourselves in our well-doing. In other words, none of us have arrived. But as Philippians said, we forget those things that are behind. We forget those sins. We forget those shortcomings. And we press towards Christ and towards his heavenly call. So with patience and well-doing, we seek for glory and honor and immortality. Where is all of that found? It is found In Jesus Christ, we seek to have our life hidden in his. How do we get there? Again, we go back to Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Only through belief, not from our own righteousness. Amen. So, our prayer today is that, first of all, like if we have been found to be judging one another, or we have found ourselves in the text that we think highly of ourselves, or We think lowly of others. If we are rightly repulsed by sin, but wrongly accusatory and condemning and judging one another, I want to give us time to repent for that and give us time to be like that tax collector that says, God, have mercy on me. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we just want to take time to examine ourselves. Father, help us to have a heart and a mind that judges ourselves. Lord, we repent for those times where We have been self-righteous. We repent for those times where we have thought of ourselves as the standard. Lord, we repent for those times where we have gossiped about one another. Those times where instead of going to one another in love, we gossip or we slander or we look down and condemn. Lord, help us to see our own selves truly and rightly. Help us to see ourselves as those who are sinners but have been saved by grace. We thank you that like that woman that was caught in adultery, Lord, that you don't condemn us but instead you forgive us and you tell us to go away and stop it. And Lord, as we examine our hearts before we take communion, Lord, again, please show us those areas of our lives that need attention. Show us those areas of our lives that have become lackadaisical in serving you. 
Lord, give us that mind that was in Christ Jesus, Lord, that mind of humility. Help us to love one another well, Lord. We understand that this is one of the marks by which they will know that we are truly your disciples. God, we just love you and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.